most of us at some time in our lives have looked back to the time when the face of Britain was beautiful and the natural products of the soil were harvested so that man might eat and live. Most of us have longed for the return of that epoch of serenity when in the quiet villages each cottage and house stood in its garden in groups around the church. In those villages men lived and died with little thought outside the life of their self-contained community, loving and knowing only the things that belonged to the soil which was their livelihood. Exchange of goods, exchange of knowledge, makes a market town the center of activity. Products of the soil are exchanged for products of the town. And beneath the cathedral spreads out a maze of streets, alleys, and open markets. Thus, as man first made it, the framework of Britain was a pattern of hedges and fields and trees and hamlets which has been handed down through generations of unceasing effort and knowledge deep-rooted in the land. That pattern stood first and foremost for work, and while men labored at the sowing and at the harvest, the face of the land remained beautiful. But under this lovely face of Britain, in six great regions, there lies coal. Coal changed the face of Britain and the life of its people, for coal meant steam. And steam meant power to drive the wheels of industry. So a new kind of work arose and disfigured the face of the land. The sun was hidden behind the smoke clouds of furnace and factory. Because power determines industrial location, so the six coal fields of Britain 
represented the centers of activity and expansion. Without plan or order, without thought of future decades, industry was developed as fast as men could work and build. There grew up a teeming population of factory and mine workers. There grew up huge centers of manufacture and countless small buildings, uglier still, to house the servants of industry. Meadow and field were blotched with giant tips for slag. The power of steam and coal dominated the land. It gave Britain a new place in the sun. It gave her industrial, economic, and political power. But at how terrible a price in the degradation and destruction of human life. And so today, we endure this heritage of the Industrial Revolution, spreading its congestion of factories and slums over the face of the land, leaving for new generations the shell of a prosperous age. But far from industrial chaos, in the mountains of the north, in pool and stream, in waterfall and lake, the source of a new power waits. So electricity is born to bring back the sun to Britain. A nation plan is formed to 
carry power and light into the furthest corners of the land. Locks are dammed to make giant reservoirs of energy. Waterfalls are harnessed, rivers diverted along new man-made channels, tunnels are bored and aqueducts constructed so that turbines may turn to create the great new driving power and enable huge quantities of this energy to be controlled by one man. From coal also comes the new power, and at central points throughout the land, great power stations grow up, nerve centers of the new energies, tour houses of untold force. major points the power is controlled, shifted from one part of the country to another so that the needs of industry, agriculture and the home may be kept supplied. Okay, we'll be ready. Hello, Brighton, Bankside here. You can ease off now to 15,000 kilowatts and hold it till I ask you to reduce again. Okay, I'll shut down number three set right away. From the sources of this energy to north, south, east and west, the pylons carry their living load over mountains, fields and rivers, never checking in their stride as they carry the new power to the waiting cities and the eager countryside. So, with the coming of mobile power through the length and breadth of the land into the small villages of the countryside and into the big centers of manufacture, industry is at last freed from the restricted areas and need no longer be chained to the coal fields. And the heavy smoke clouds of the past can be dissipated forever. But a plan for power is only part of a greater plan to make Britain a land designed for living, to make a new age possible great new world lies ready to be created. There is much to be done. of the smoke age, the ghastly squalor brought about by the uncontrolled spread of industry, the chaos and filth of an obsolete age, the scarred and derelict ruins that today are the seats of unemployment and misery, can have no place in the new face of the land. Not only must slums be cleared, but we must see that nothing ugly takes their place. The new communities must be planned in whole and in detail, with a full understanding of the practical and cultural needs of a new society. Strange new architectures arise to meet the demands of a changing civilization, shapes and forms of simple beauty dictated only by the purpose which they are meant to serve. Out of steel, glass and concrete, the architects and engineers must transform the face of Britain. All the efficiencies and amenities of the 20th century are ready to be used. New sources of power, new means of communication, new methods and new processes are here for the service of men. This is an age of scientific planning, of organization, of cooperation and collective working.
great new dwelling places rise up, replacing the old chaos of the slums, housing in cleaner, saner and healthier conditions the peoples of the cities. Machinery and science can bring about a better conditions of working and permit greater freedom for leisure, for getting away from the sphere of work into the open countryside. But these are but the beginnings of what must be done. Britain has tremendous wealth of human material and physical resources. She is now at a turning point in her civilization. If her citizens will realize alike the opportunity and their own responsibilities, they can make this ancient land a well-ordered and gracious heritage where the sun will always shine for the children of the future.